These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. It is impossible to talk about the differences in daily life between Bronze Age Mesopotamia, like we discussed in the episodes on Old Babylon, and in Hittite Anatolia without confronting one main fact. Clay was not the preferred writing material in Anatolia like it was in Mesopotamia. While still common, it wasn't quite as abundant as in the South, and in Anatolia they simply had more options for other media. Stone was, of course, available, but costly and difficult to work in. Much easier to work and more attractive and impressive to the eye was to write down what you intend to say in a clay tablet as a rough draft, maybe, but then to transfer that over to a final copy on a plate of bronze or even silver or gold for display in public or to send to other kings as letters of gold. For the common man, on the other hand, this would be an extravagance likely out of reach for most, but you could get your contracts written on a block of wood, and they would almost certainly survive into your grandchildren's generation. Both of these sound really nice to me. They could be attractive artifacts if any were recovered. The problem is that almost none of them have been recovered. The wood that likely bore the majority of common documents like wedding contracts and low-level transactions has rotted away. The metals were plundered and melted down by later generations, too valuable to leave sitting in silent testament to long-dead events which means we're left with a fraction of the total text corpus today. Similarly, the Hittites were magnificent sculptors, and almost none of that survives because they loved to cast invaluable metal. The Hittites married, did business, and lived from day to day, but almost none of that survives either because they carved it in impermanent wood. And so, when we come to talk about daily life of the average Anatolian under the Hittite Empire, there are many things we can say about what their life looked like, but equally, there are many things we have to be silent on, and many details that simply can't be filled in. Anatolian society, both within and without the empire, since throughout the region, daily life would have looked pretty similar whether you were under the Hittites or one of the peripheral kingdoms, was centered around the village. We, in modern English, used different words for village, town, and city, with different implicit sizes. But for the Hittites, there was only one word for all of these, and conceptually, even the greatest city was an extension of the village. The village could range from nothing but a collection of a few houses, which probably made up the majority of place names that we're unable to identify in the record, all the way up to the great city of Hattusha, with population estimates at its height of 15 to 40,000. The smallest of these villages leave, obviously, the smallest trace in the archaeological record. But of the modest-sized towns that have been excavated, there is a remarkable amount of order apparent in the layouts and services visible in the archaeological record. The roads of an Anatolian town were straight, and not too narrow for the most part. They liked to meet at 90 degree angles, and would go on straight for as long as possible in often hilly terrain, and were often surfaced with crushed gravel. These might sound almost trivial to a modern ear used to asphalt roads, but it tells us that there must have been a strong focus on something that might approximate urban planning in an Anatolian town, and provides evidence for fairly strong town leadership. That crushed gravel would have been crushed by hand, likely by men on work details for their annual labor duties. For when the Anatolian kings saw that in Mesopotamia they could call up the men for a month or two every year to work on public service projects, the Anatolian kings decided to get in on the action too. Seriously, these roads are impressive, not quite up to the Roman standards, but those are still a millennium and a half away. These were surveyed to be straight and to conform to the terrain. They were packed with gravel and often have sewage ditches running alongside, covered with flagstones to keep the stench contained as much as possible. 
These drainage ditches would have small pipes flowing into them from the houses with walls facing the street. Not long plumbing with valves like the Romans had, but still a way to conveniently dispose of wastewater from within a home. Quite often, the town itself would be terraced out to allow the city to be built in a more orderly fashion despite the hilly terrain. Now, someone was in charge of laying out roads. Someone was in charge of the large amount of labor required to build and maintain the roads. Someone had to figure out how to connect all the drainage ditches and join them up to keep them all flowing downhill and passing out of town. Though we have no direct evidence for this, it's clear just from the ruins of the towns that public planning was a well-considered discipline practiced throughout Anatolia. The exact sort of organization running the town appears to have varied from place to place. Anatolia is a peninsula full of different cultures and customs, even under Hittite hegemony. But generally speaking, a council of elder men, heads of prominent families, would meet from time to time. We also hear about singular leaders of each town, the man of the city, who was likely selected by the council in independent cities, or inherited the position from his father, or was appointed by the city's overlord, such as the Hittite king in Hittite territory. It isn't clear how much power these councils actually had. Some argue they were a significant force, while others suspect they were little more than a social club for important old men to complain. And indeed, it may have varied from place to place according to local custom. Whoever was ultimately in charge, however, he had a broad array of responsibilities, beyond just the roads. We actually have a description of the official responsibilities of the mayor of Hattusha, which included fire protection, public sanitation, securing the water supply, posting of the guards, and ensuring that the gates were closed each night. On northern frontier towns, the governors were also responsible for maintaining intel on nearby enemies, for ensuring that all peasants made it into the walls each night, for maintaining any temples and palaces in their jurisdiction, and they were deputized for the administration of justice in all but the most severe of cases. We can assume that other city leaders in other places were charged with similar duties, though with less worry about the threat of Kaskin raids the further you got from the north. In the south, city leaders were additionally charged with protecting merchants and travelers from banditry, and could in some cases be liable should a merchant be waylaid. This is an active government, deeply involved in the lives and welfare of its people. Security and infrastructure were public priorities, and much of it is explicitly focused on the common people, such as the insistence that corvée labor be expended on fine roadways rather than great temples or noble palaces. Indeed, the palaces may have been privately funded in many cases from the wealth of the high families rather than the public coffers, since in Hattusha they've excavated a number of miniature castles for non-royal noble clans situated right in the middle of the city itself, both defensive and luxurious structures for the aristocrats to reside in. It certainly wasn't an egalitarian system nor a benevolent socialism. But the leaders of cities and kingdoms alike clearly felt an obligation towards improving life for their citizens. Of course, what that looked like in practice is a bit different. Directly next to the straight and orderly main roads, the private residences of the common townsfolk were a disordered jumble. One archaeologist has speculated that it may have been unfashionable to build a house using proper 90 degree angles. Or it may simply be the case that homes were constructed just to a much poorer standard overall, one where even a simple box-shaped room becomes irregular through a lack of care on the builder's part. It's often close enough to rectangular that you can see what they were aiming at, but archaeological diagrams of city sections end up looking like irregular warrens running up against clean and even main roads. That shouldn't fool you into thinking that these irregular houses were necessarily squalid or miserable, at least not by the standards of the Bronze Age. 
They tended to be built of large stone at the base and mud brick above, or when possible of stone all the way through and reinforced either way with timbers, which helped absorb shock during minor earthquakes. A typical house consisted of two to three rooms for a lower or middle class resident, perhaps a fourth or fifth room for a modestly prosperous family, fronted by a semi-walled open courtyard with a partial roof, serving half as front porch and half as a center of family industry, where the tasks you didn't want to do in a small, confined room could be undertaken. The courtyard, or sometimes an enclosed room off to the side, is where the single household sink is located, into which all household waste is dumped to flow through clay pipes to the semi-covered drainage ditches in the road. Inside, there are a few high small windows to allow heat and smoke to escape but it's hoped that the thickness of the walls and roof kept the sleeping quarters from growing too terribly hot or cold in winter and summer. Each home had a hearth for cooking, and most have a sink with a drain made of stone and baths made of clay. But aside from that, most common folk likely owned almost no furniture, doing most of their living, eating, and working on the ground of packed dirt, or gravel, or sometimes flagstones. Very little of their equipment survives, mostly being made of wood, but simple brushes have been found, as well as pottery and small art objects and a few similar things. Material wealth was exceedingly spare by modern standards, and even the tiny houses may not have been too cramped full of objects. But let's say that you are a young man in a modest Anatolian village. Your skin is lightly bronzed. Your muscles are decently toned from the hardships of daily life. If you haven't been scarred by one of the many childhood diseases or stunted by a childhood famine, you're probably fairly handsome with good skin and a well-developed body from having much more well-rounded nutrition than most other Bronze Age peoples. You keep your black hair long, well past the shoulders, and maybe covering the shoulder blades, which is good because it's naturally quite attractive, straight, or perhaps given to light waves. You could bind it with a string if you needed to, but fashion usually seems to dictate that you refrain from that when possible. On top of your head is a small conical cap, not unlike an overgrown yarmulke, that covers from the top of your forehead to the top of your neck likely made of leather, though possibly of wool. The cone only sticks up a few inches, enough to help keep the hot cap off your head. You're not wearing a giant dunce cap, usually. Below the neck, you wear a long one-piece wool tunic that covers from shoulders to below the knees and has long sleeves. Men at war would wear much less, and it's possible that during heavy labor as well, men would drop down to nothing but a knee-length kilt. But for the most part, the long, plain tunic was the standard for most people. On your feet, you wear plain shoes or boots, with a slight bit of extra material that would curve up at the toes, because this was highly fashionable. Wealthier men may have worn taller caps and shoes with a bit more floofy curve coming up, but the core of the woolen garment would have been largely the same for many. Of your childhood, there is almost nothing we can say for certain, except that many of the issues you faced, like high childhood mortality and periodic famines and just general hardship, would have been common to most Bronze Age civilizations. But by now, you're mostly grown, you toughened, you're inured to hardship. But there's no time for you to celebrate the miracle of being alive today. Your mother is sending you out on chores. Many of the domestic duties are handled by the women of the house, your mother, your sisters, and any other women of your extended family. Something you almost certainly fail to appreciate like you should, taking for granted the ceaseless labors of the women in the home. But even though there is much being done for you, there's little chance to stand idle. You step out of the door into your family courtyard, making sure to close the door gently behind you. The door of your family home is one of the most expensive possessions you own, 
and overtaxing the precious bronze hinges is a good way to earn a solid beating from your father. Most of the women of the house are working here in the courtyard. The open air is good for cooking to keep the smoke from building up inside, and being able to see out onto the street allows them to call out to passers-by and share gossip as they weave or cook or do whatever myriad little tasks that the house requires. You step out onto the street, broad and straight, stepping from the flagstones over the drain onto the crushed gravel of the main road. An odor hangs over the road as the drainage system doesn't work very well without rainfall. It's been a hot, dry summer, allowing the filth to just sort of collect and fester. At least it's just the smell. In barbarian countries, the impure waste is allowed to sit in the open, offending the gods and bringing disease. It isn't far to walk down the street before you reach a structure built quite like your own house, but with a handful of shops instead of living quarters. Stepping in, there's a small catwalk that you ascend so you can look down on five or so giant clay pots, some two meters tall and wide. Each is full of water, drawn from the spring that's often inconveniently far away, and so the shopkeeper will sell you however much you need to fill your family water pot for a reasonable price. Either a very, very small amount of hard metal measured by weight, or more likely in barter for a measure of grain or other foods. If your pot is broken, this water shop has a large stock of utilitarian replacements in the back for you to purchase as well. But, if you had broken the family pot, you know your mother's wrath would be a far greater concern. Incidentally, this water shop I'm describing is a real shop, uncovered in actual archaeological excavations, just like the next place you're about to visit. You filled your pot, but by the storm god it's heavy, and you were doing chores all morning. So, you put it down for a moment and slip just around the corner. Behind the water shop, you spot a familiar spot, a long mud brick bar preventing your entry into the establishment proper. But it doesn't matter, since plenty of young men are leaning upon the bar itself, also taking a moment of rest after a long day. Why do you have an extra measure of grain in your pocket? Is it because you had planned to take this break at the start? Whatever the reason, you tell the barkeeper, who is as likely to be a woman as a man, to pour you a cup as you hand over the required measure in return. There's no formal currency, but standard weights of raw grain spend easily enough. Unlike your contemporaries in Babylonia, who you've probably never met except perhaps as deported slaves, the menu at this bar is more than just barley beer of various thicknesses and alcohol contents. Depending on how much you can spend, grape wine is almost certainly an option here, or perhaps the wine of another fruit if there is a sizable local orchard. But it isn't just drink available for purchase, the barkeep has a small food preparation area back there, on which small snacks, probably some sort of local special, can be whipped up pretty quick. Of course, the point of an establishment like this has never primarily been about the refreshments. There is room for perhaps a half-dozen men of various ages to idle, and more could easily stand around in the alley on a busy night. No women are present, for while women are not strictly kept in the home at all times, and some women could even run drinking establishments in their own right, the idea of a woman intruding so far into the public sphere as to patronize such an establishment would have been unthinkably shameful and it's likely even a woman descended into prostitution would avoid that added shame. And so the men stand and lean on things and drink and snack and gossip. No one bothered to write down in stone what sort of topics were being discussed around cups of beer, but surely it was mostly the same then as it is now. Weather, relationships, politics, stories, little songs, women, hardships, business, or news from other villages. And when talk doesn't suffice to keep things interesting, games of all sort could be played. 
It's known that what we now call the Royal Game of Ur, or the Egyptian board game Senate, had made it to Anatolia. But whether you would have it in your community or not is much harder to say. Still, the barkeep does definitely have a stock of dozens of knuckle bones for what would appear to have been the most popular gambling games, as well as clay discs to use as gambling chips. Among children, these knuckle bones, which are actually sheep ankle bones despite the English name, can be played like jacks, but among the adults, these approximate cubes can be rolled like dice for making any number of simple wagers. The roll of dice, the pounding of empty cups, and the laughter of young men could well echo out into the streets of any age. But it's well past time for you to grab your water pot again and carry it home through the broad moonlit streets of your Bronze Age Anatolian village. Your mother is unimpressed by your lateness, and your father will strike you sternly for it. But this isn't the first time you've been disciplined, and it's unlikely to be your last. Recently, however, your parents have noticed that you aren't idling with the other young men quite as often as you used to. They are, after all, men, and you've reached an age when you're expected and probably eager to start getting into some more feminine companionship. It's hard to speak to a woman alone in the village, especially without being noticed by anyone else. But even a medium-sized town is small enough that you recognize all the women of appropriate age by sight, and have managed at least a few words with all the eligible ones. The experiences in passing, as well as attending the frequent festivals supplemented by the endless village gossip, means that you now have a good idea of who you would like to pursue romantically. There's a chance that the young woman on the other end has even given you subtle encouragements, but it's perhaps more likely that she hasn't realized she's caught your eye yet. The first step in this is to speak with your own father. For a slightly older or more independent man, this step is optional, but you are young enough yet that you're not the head of your own household, and fortunate enough that your father will be gifting you enough to help form a respectable bride price. Your father will evaluate the lady according to what he thinks of her virtues, as well as the wealth and status of her family. Or, perhaps more likely, he's already considered most of the marriageable women in the village on your behalf, and can provide a pretty quick answer. There are countless stories told throughout history of obstacles to love and passion denied, and the Hittite law code even details many ways a marriage could go wrong or a love could go sideways. But for our story today, your father agrees that this woman would make a suitable partner for you. And so, as the head of your household, he goes to the father of the woman and begins the process of negotiating on your behalf. You and the woman may have meetings, and the woman's opinion on the matter may be sought, but both of these parts are frankly optional, and so long as a good contract can be negotiated, the union will be approved of by both parties. This is very much a business deal at heart, and while often passions are involved, or efforts are made by both families to kindle love in the bride and groom, Sometimes the marriages are arranged for economic reasons first, and the love comes later, if at all. This can sound rough, but evidence from modern times suggests that arranged marriages are on average no less happy or prone to failure than purely love matches. With the arrangements complete, a modest initial marriage gift is given, and the engagement is on. Both parties are expected to remain faithful during this engagement period, and at some point either the woman will move to the husband's father's house, or the man could move into his wife's father's house. This is different from the strictly patrilocal character of marriage in most other parts of the ancient world, and many details of the wedding and betrothal seems to have differed in different communities. In patrilocal communities, it would be customary for the woman to join the man's household, as is common in most of Mesopotamia. In matrilocal communities, it would be customary for the man to join the woman's father's house. 
Furthermore, it seems that in certain instances, usually when the man was of much lower wealth or status, there was a possibility for the man to join the woman's father's house, despite it being a patrilocal community, in exchange for waiving the bride price, or when it was politically or economically advantageous for the man to join the woman's house. The Hittite rulers, for the most part, were quite happy to rule over a patchwork of different customs, and in many parts of the law provide for local diversity in doing things. That said, by the time of the Hittites, and the time which we have historical data, there may have been a mix of patrilineal and matrilineal communities, but there were no matriarchal groups at this point and whether there ever were in prehistory is controversial at best. In a matrilineal or matrilocal community, a man would have moved in with his wife and may have reckoned descent through his mother, but that household was still run by the wife's father or another man of similar status. Women were not in formal command of government or household. All of Anatolia was strictly patriarchal by the time of the Hittite kingdom. Perhaps most emblematic of the woman's position in Anatolian society was the wedding itself. While no actual marriage contracts have survived from Anatolia, we're given to understand that they're generally quite similar to those in Mesopotamia in the essentials. After a period of betrothal, at the end of which the bride price would be paid in full by the groom or his family, a great feast would be held. Friends and family would eat and drink and generally have quite a nice time, at least as nice as the hosting family could afford, and everyone would be dressed in their finest clothes. For a poor family, this may just mean everything was recently washed, but for a family doing well for themselves, most members of the family would own a set of festival clothes. In shape, these were essentially the same as the long tunics worn every other day, but along the side, running vertically, they featured special bands of trim with geometric designs most likely in blue or red, though purple was also available to import from the south for the extremely wealthy. These were often called hurrian shirts, though it isn't completely clear that they actually came from the hurrians, but even that modest band of colored fabric framing the outlines of the shirt would have really made it much nicer and much more festive than the standard plain long tunics. In addition, as wealth levels rose, jewelry of gold, silver, and bronze would begin to adorn the guests, rings, necklaces, and bracelets that could even be inset with lapis lazuli, carnelian, or faience. One assumes that the curved toes of the shoes would be extra floofy for the occasion as well, and even taller conical hats might be worn. Though I should be careful not to mock it too much, for what will people 4,000 years from now think of our own modern fashions? Anyway, at a certain point in the evening, the couple would be brought together before a priest, likely one representing the host family's patron god. Prayers would be prayed and words would be said, but the climax of the whole affair would be the physical exchange of a contract, carved in wood for the poor folk but in precious metals for wealthy families, and then the ownership of the woman in question would pass from her father to her husband. Aside from the feasting, the principle of the exchange differs not in the slightest from the purchase of a house or other precious commodity. There is no dedicated word in Neshili, the Hittite language, for marriage. Rather, a man is said to take his wife, and thereafter possess her. However, while women were not given the same sort of respect or authority that men enjoyed, they were not completely and utterly oppressed. The new wife would be given by her father a dowry, a sum of wealth that was held in sacred trust should the marriage fail. This was a woman's primary protection in society, since it was widely assumed that an independent woman would be unable to provide for herself in an economic sense this side of prostitution. Hittite laws allowed for divorce to be filed relatively easily by both women and men, and many protections in the divorce process allowed for each party to have a claim on children and wealth. 
and widows are frequently cited by Hittite kings as a vulnerable group that the king watches out for in his charity and policy making. Though the scale and regularity of these gifts to widows is hard to pin down clearly. Ultimately, a woman who really did not want to be married to her husband had ways to get out of it, either during the betrothal or after marriage. Although given the patriarchal nature of economy and society in the ancient world, these came with very real costs. The men of the Hittite world may have seen themselves as protectors of a woman's dignity, but they were a long way from modern feminists. Still, from everything we can see, it appears that the majority of marriages throughout all the world and all of time have been at least workable, and often happy and loving. As to the size of that family, Anatolians preferred to group themselves into nuclear families, two parents and three to eight children. Monogamy was the rule, and while certain exceptions may have been carved out for the king and particular special cases, society from top to bottom was organized under the expectation of monogamy. Men could, as was usual in ancient times, carry on affairs with prostitutes and other unattached women with little consequence, but they could typically only hold one wife at a time. As the children grew older, it's possible that the inheriting son likely stayed with the parents, but any surplus children would be expected to move out, either as part of the wedding or a decent time later, to found their own households. Inheritance law is not spelled out with the precision that we find in the Mesopotamian law codes such as Hammurabi, and may have been fully at the discretion of the dying man, likely subject to cultural constraints that varied considerably from region to region. But as we saw with the Hittite kings, there was no particular pressure that the main inheriting son be the firstborn, just whatever the father thought best to carry on the family legacy. That legacy, and the economic life of Anatolians in general, is something I find fascinating, and something that we can speak quite a lot about. However, while I had intended to cover it in this show, it seems that just matters of family life have taken up nearly an entire episode, and I have a whole extra episode worth of economic matters to look at, and so I'm going to split it here and leave the rest for next week. We've seen what a Hittite family looks like, but next week we're going to see what they do with themselves all day. Farmers, tradesmen, merchant, and slaves all have to go to work every day, just like we do nowadays. And when they do this in the context of the Hittite economic and legal system, there is a lot of interesting things that we can say about it. So join us next time as we continue to look at daily life in ancient Anatolia with a discussion of the free economy, the temple and palace economy, the endless festivals, and the detailed law code that regulated it all. Thank you for listening.